All right. So Dan, I would just like for you to introduce yourself um, and tell us what you do. Sure. My name is Dan Rolfe. I'm on the faculty at Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland, Oregon. Um, many years ago, I also co-founded our domestic environmental law clinic at Lewis and Clark, which is called Earthrise Law Center. In that capacity, um, in the past primarily, um, I worked as an attorney with students on cases largely focused on the Endangered Species Act. Um, however, uh, I teach full, I've taught full time for um, quite a few years at this point. Um, and my teaching and scholarship focuses to a significant degree on biodiversity issues and biodiversity protection and management, um, including uh, prominently the Endangered Species Act. Um, I teach a number of co related courses at Lewis and Clark, including um, our wildlife law class. Um, I teach public lands and a class on the intersection of law and science, which is pretty relevant when we talk about endangered species. Oh, that's awesome. So, okay, with this, um, the anniversary of the Endangered Species, species Act um, coming up, <clears throat> we just wanted to ask you a few questions and kind of get a little of your input. Um, one of the biggest questions that I have are, um, with okay, looking ahead with this act, what do you believe are the most pressing priorities for strengthening the ESA? And what role can the public, policymakers, and scientists play in ensuring the long-term success of endangered species conservation efforts? Sure, I think the Endangered Species Act has done a tremendous amount of positive, um, a tremendous number of positive things for uh, biodiversity conservation in the United States. Um, for example, uh, section seven of the statute um, applies particular uh, restrictions to federal agencies and federal agencies have to ensure that their actions don't uh, destroy or adversely modify critical habitat or jeopardize the continued existence of listed species. And the statute also sets up a consultation process uh, between agencies that are taking an action that may affect listed species or their habitat and the so-called expert agencies, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service. And that alone um, requires that federal agencies at least consider and actually um, make accommodations for endangered species and their habitat in virtually everything that federal agencies do. So um, that alone has been a game changer because it affects not only the actions of federal agencies, which especially in the Western portion of the United States includes managing about half the land um, of that huge region of the country, but um, federal agencies uh, actually issue all sorts of um, very important permits. Uh, the federal government funds a lot of activities, highways, etc. And so in all of those decisions as well, um, federal agencies have to consider the needs of threatened and endangered species. So in that sense, um, the Endangered Species Act has been a game changer. It also applies to um, everyone. Um, no one can kill or injure a listed species without a permit. Um, and that even includes habitat impacts that result in death or injury of a species. And so um, the ESA really applies um, to all of our actions across the board, which I think has been really important over the last half a century. I think the primary challenges the ESA faces today and um, will face certainly into the future um, relate to its implementation, um, as well as its funding. Um, Congress over the years has never really adequately funded the recovery um, efforts that are crucial under the Endangered Species Act um, to bring species to the listed species to the point where they no longer need um, special federal legal protections. And so, 
um, increased funding uh, from Congress would go a long way to um, increasing the number of species that we can delist as uh, recovered. Um, at the same time, it takes uh, federal agencies um, oftentimes far too long to add species to the lists of threatened or endangered species that need to be protected. Um, we just saw wolverines uh, were listed, for example, and that was a culmination of about two decades worth of efforts, primarily from environmental organizations to try to um, garner protections for that species. And obviously two decades uh, to try to protect a species is way too long. Too long, right. Um, and so those implementation challenges um, are, are uh, something we really need to address. Um, another really significant one that I've focused my scholarship on recently is uh, the mandate in Section 7 um, that federal agencies can't destroy or adversely modify critical habitat or jeopardize the continued existence of protected species. But the way that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service interpret those terms um, allows uh, for impacts for federal agency actions that have adverse impacts on both protected species and their critical habitat in a manner that essentially allows for the gradual decline of both listed species and their critical habitat. So really, um, we allow federal actions that lead us in the opposite direction um, of where we really need to go. Obviously, when a, a species is facing extinction, we need to do everything we can to try to restore that species and its critical habitat. Um, but as the uh, agencies responsible for implementing the Endangered Species Act interpret really important terms under the statute, they effectively allow management of protected species and their habitat to gradually decline over time. So it's pretty hard to recover species when we say, well, we'll let them decline to uh, a greater degree toward extinction, and then we'll try okay. to recover them. So um, I think those sorts of implementation ch challenges, um, as well as greater congressional commitment um, to funding the act um, are really important for the future. There's, one other aspect uh, of the statute that we just saw um, play out in Alaska as well that I think is is crucial, not only for uh, protecting threatened and endangered species, but also for helping us address climate change. Mm -hmm. And that's another aspect of um, the Section 7, so-called Section 7 protections um, for listed species that I've already mentioned. Um, and as the, the services also interpret Section 7, they can essentially ignore the impacts on um, listed species and their critical habitat from greenhouse gas emissions. Wow. And we saw that play out in the Willow Project, um, which is a massive um, federal oil and gas lease uh, on the North Slope of Alaska, the Bureau of Land Management issued leases um, to Chevron that will allow pumping of millions of barrels of oil. And of course, burning that oil will produce massive amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but in looking at the impacts of that federal action, both the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service essentially ignored those greenhouse gas emissions and their impacts on species like polar bears. Uh, and of course, polar bears were listed primarily as a result of the decline of their pack ice habitat uh, due to climate change. Um, and yet we essentially turn around and ignore uh, mm -hmm. the impacts of greenhouse gas emissions when we look at federal actions that affect polar bears. So that, of course, makes no sense whatsoever under the Endangered Species Act. That policy was first um, crafted in the George W. Bush administration, um, and it's disappointing to 
see both the Biden administration as well as the Obama administration before it defend and even use um, that uh, interpretation of the Endangered Species Act. Um, yeah. Environmental organizations uh, and um, uh, Alaska Native groups um, challenged that decision in court. Unfortunately, the district court sided um, with the federal defendant. So going forward, that's something we really need to rethink because climate change is such a, a huge threat to many threatened endangered species that it makes no sense um, to essentially discount the impacts of greenhouse gas emissions on threatened yeah. endangered species and their habitat. So I think going forward, um, we could use the ESA as a tool to both protect species and their habitat from the ravages of, of climate change and really help our country um, reduce its greenhouse gas emissions, which, of course, we have highlighted that we need to do anyway. Yeah. So I'm glad you mentioned that Alaska group that um, challenged that because over the past year, um, a couple of our policy analysts have done some work on public participation. And so I'm wondering um, how, like has public awareness um, played a role in conservation efforts under the ESA? And are there any other um, instances that you can recall um, where public engagement initiatives have stood out to, you know, help with conservation of some of these end endangered species? Sure. One of the strengths of the Endangered Species Act is its allowance for broad pr public participation in efforts to protect threatened and endangered species. So, for example, Section 4 of the statute allows any interested party to petition the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or the National Marine Fisheries Service to list a species as threatened or endangered. Um, uh, groups can ask uh, those agencies to delist uh, a species mm. as well. And we see that sometimes, especially from um, opponents uh, of the Endangered Species Act. But um, the over the last few decades, um, the vast majority of species that have been listed as threatened or endangered um, uh, originated from a petition um, from the public asking agencies to list a species as threatened or endangered. So um, that's that's really important. Um, the listing process itself um, requires that the services go through a notice and comment rulemaking um, in considering a species for listing or in delisting a species and declaring a species recovered or even delisting species because they're extinct. That has to go through uh, a public involvement process and um, so information from the public um, can play an important role in, in making those sorts of decisions. The ESA also has a pretty broad citizen suit provision um, that allows um, interested parties to enforce the statute um, as well, to either to challenge federal actions um, that aren't adequately protecting listed species, or even um, use the citizen suit provision to challenge the actions of a third party. Um, so for example, in Oregon, um, some organizations challenged the state of Oregon and its management of state forests as not adequately protecting the nesting habitat of marbled murrelets and thus causing an illegal take uh, or killing of, of marbled murrelets by um, essentially cutting down their habitat. Um, that action was successful and it's really forced um, the state to craft um, better management policies for state forests. So that's just an example um, of how citizens can play an important role um, in enforcing the statute as well. So yeah, the ESA has lots of opportunities for public participation, and those have been um, really important um, to protect threatened and endangered species and their habitat. Awesome. Um, I'm going to turn over to Spencer. I think he has one or two questions as well. Um, yeah, thank you, Rachel. Um, this has been really great so far. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about challenges to the Endangered Species Act. I'd like to hear more about um, opposition generally 
Um, where does it come from? Um, it, partly public perception, but also more concerted opposition, whether it's politicians or private actors. Um, why do people, why do the, why do the opponents of the Endangered Species Act oppose the Endangered Species Act? Sure, there are lots of reasons that um, people may oppose protections for threatened endangered species in their habitat. Um, some are quite misguided. <laughs> So for example, in, in the latest case, the latest Endangered Species Act case that went to the US Supreme Court, um, there was a landowner that was objecting to um, a rule which included part of that landowner's private land within a designation of so-called critical habitat um, for an endangered species. So section four provides um, that the services should designate an area called critical habitat um, that's essential for the recovery of listed species. But um, even though private land can be included in those critical habitat designations, um, the statute's prohibition against destroying or adversely modifying critical habitat only applies to federal agencies, so it doesn't ap apply um, to private landowners. But still, there's a huge misconception by private landowners um, that if their property is included in a critical habitat designation, that that creates some sort of wildlife preserve or something like that on their land um, when it really does not. So um, some of the opposition from for the to the Endangered Species Act just uh, arises from simple misunderstandings of the law. Um, but others perceive the statute as... Um, slowing down economic development or inhibiting property rights, um, those sorts of things. And it's really something we see with all environmental law. Um, environmental laws are typically just a way to um, force us to internalize costs. So when we cut down trees, yeah, the tree, trees have value and you can sell timber on the market, and oftentimes um, forest landowners or timber companies, that's kind of all they think about is, well, let's, what's the bottom line? You know, how much money can we get from these trees? And um, that essentially discounts a lot of other costs imposed on society as a result of, of that action. So cutting down trees can impact water quantity as well as water quality. Um, it, uh, you know, forests and trees obviously are huge um, uh, carbon sinks. They're the ways that, that nature itself stores carbon. Um, and so uh, cutting down forests essentially liberates carbon, contributes to climate change. Um, so all of those costs um, are oftentimes just borne by the public, but, the Endangered Species Act essentially says, now, wait a minute, you know, if when you're cutting down a forest, you need to think about the impacts on threatened northern spotted owls mm -hmm. or other imperiled forest species. Or you need to think about the impacts of uh, sediment um, pollution on salmon. Um, and so the Endangered Species Act forces us to internalize those costs and may restrict timber harvest in, in some areas. And, um, you know, a lot of people see that or some people see that as an economic cost that they don't want to bear. And so that um, drives opposition uh, to the Endangered Species Act. We typically see that play out in Congress um, as Republicans um, calling for amendments um, to weaken the Endangered Species Act. Democrats um, generally have um, stood pretty firm for the most part um, in uh, saying that the Endangered Species Act is an important um, federal environmental law that we really need to protect. Um, one uh, talking point that I think um, that opponents of the Endangered Species Act lean on quite heavily um, is something that I think is a real misrepresentation um, of the statute. So typically you'll hear opponents of the, of the Endangered Species Act say, well, uh, if you look at the ESA's track record over the last 50 years of its existence since it was passed in 1973, um, there have been relatively few species 
that have been delisted um, as recovered, that we've listed them as threatened or endangered, the statute has worked to recover the species, and so now we can take them off the list. And that's true. There have not been as many species um, recovered that we'd like to see. Obviously, um, we'd like to see all the species that have been listed uh, declared recovered. And unfortunately, um, only uh, a relatively modest percentage of, of species have been delisted and declared um, recovered. But that results um, from a lot of things, as I mentioned, inadequate recovery funding um, the fact that many species were listed when they were in real biological trouble. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you can't turn that around in just a couple of years and say, oh, yeah, you know, that yeah. that statute worked, you know, just took us five years and boom, no problem. Um, obviously, protecting species and the ecosystems they depend on is a long term proposition. And so, um, you know, it took decades for many species to get to the point where they're facing extinction. So we shouldn't su be surprised that it takes sometimes significant uh, amounts of time to recover listed species. Um, if you look at the, the um, statistics and studies, um, they pretty clearly indicate that species that are listed under the Endangered Species Act and have designated critical habitat are in much better shape than they would have been um, without those legal protections. So the Endangered Species Act doesn't work, I mean, does work um, quite well. It may not work as quickly as some would like, uh, mm -hmm. or maybe even as many of us would like, um, but unfortunately the opponents of the act say, well, um, it hasn't been as successful as we'd like in recovering listed species and their prescription uh, for that observation, um, you would think that, well, if, if we if the these legal protect, protections haven't been able to recover species as quickly as we'd like, the logical thing would be to say, well, maybe we need to improve those legal protections. Maybe we need to strengthen um, the law in order to provide more protections for imperiled species in their habitat. And that could recover them faster. Well, that would be the logical approach. Um, but many opponents of the ESA say, well, it hasn't been very successful at, at recovering species, so therefore we should dramatically weaken it. <laughs> Which That's obviously good. is really uh, the opposite thing um, that mm -hmm. you would do to, to resolve that problem. So, but it's been a pretty effective talking point for ESA opponents. Um, and I think it's really important to counter that idea that, yeah, it would be great to improve the ESA's track record and speed up the recovery of listed species. But to do that, um, we need to better fund the, the ESA. We need to better implement the Endangered Species Act. And we need to list more species as threatened or endangered. Mm -hmm. And the thing we don't need to do is weaken the law. Right, right. I love that. Yeah, that's really good. Um, I feel like we could keep going on this. It's <laughs> so good. <laughs> Did you want to ask anything else, Spencer? Um, yeah, I had another question or two, but how are we on time? I mean, do you think we're good to wrap see, up? It's 12.58. Um, I'm thinking we can go maybe like 10 more minutes. Okay, all right, great. Yeah. Um, Okay, so yeah, I um another question I have for you is um in the piece that you wrote um that is has not been placed yet, so we can we'll we'll um we can promote that when it is. Um you talk about this um misconception that people have about the ESA as the stories that they tell about it are kind of like a species versus development, like the snail darter versus, which is the small fish versus a dam or the Northern spotted owl versus an industry. Um, and I loved how you flipped that on its head. Can you talk a little bit about that and how the, the better way to understand um, the Endangered Species Act? Sure, a lot of times when we talk about the statute, um, we do try to set up this dichotomy. It's either protect this species 
or you know our economy is going to go into the tank um you know oh we're going to protect this small obscure species and it's going to cost all sorts of money and it's going to deprive uh property owners of all their rights etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but um i think that really mischaracterizes a couple of things the uh, if you read the Endangered Species Act itself, one of its primary purposes is to protect the ecosystems upon which threatened and endangered species depend. Um, and actually, there are a number of policies where the agencies that implement the Endangered Species Act have emphasized those ecosystem protections. Um, and if we better protect listed species and their ecosystems, um, oftentimes we have huge benefits to other species um, and huge benefits to human communities as well. And so if we look at protections for biodiversity more broadly, um, we see that the steps we need to take to protect species and the, their ecosystems ultimately benefit all of us mm -hmm. because humans are part of a broader natural community and what are some of the things that we as humans really need? Well, we need clean water. We need carbon sequestration. Um, we need biodiversity for raw materials like genetic uh, resources for new medicines. Um, we need uh, to avoid um, catastrophes. We need to try to avoid wildfires. We need to build in ways that keeps uh, uh, us safe from things like increasingly strong storms and bigger floods. Well, all of those ways, uh, all of those things that we need to do to protect ourselves ultimately are protecting endangered species as well. So if we protect wetlands and floodplains, we're protecting salmon. We're protecting um, a lot of species that depend on wetlands. So we're protecting species and our cities. We're making our cities, we're making uh, people uh, and where they live more resilient in the face of climate change at the same time that we're protecting habitat and restoring listed species. If we reduce our carbon emissions, which we desperately need to do, we're protecting ourselves, but we're also addressing a key threat um, to a lot of imperiled species. So really um the the it's outmoded to look at a species versus jobs or species versus human or species versus property rights um biodiversity and protections for biodiversity is really part of the steps that we need to take to benefit ourselves as well to make our communities more resilient um, in the face of climate change to make our world more just. Um, so for example, there are um, quite uh, a number of uh, indigenous communities, Native Amer American tribes that are using the Endangered Species Act to restore the ecosystems and the resources that they depend on. So here in the Pacific Northwest, for example, tribes have used protections for Endangered Species Act uh, to help vindicate their treaty rights um, to fish, which were guaranteed to them um, almost 200 years ago, and which um, unfortunately have often been violated. And so protections for salmon, protections for salmon habitat are helping to protect the treaty rights uh, of Northwest tribes. So ultimately, really, the Endangered Species Act, yeah, it's important to protect biodiversity and to recover threatened and endangered species, but the steps we need to take to do that ultimately have huge benefits for humans um, and our society, our economy. Um, and so, you know, if we really look at the, um, the reason behind the Endangered Species Act, it's to save ourselves as much as it, as it is to save imperiled species. That's really good. I, <laughs> man, I love hearing it. <laughs> um, Spencer, did you have anything else? I have, I have one more question, okay. um, which is, so 
<clears throat> I understand that um, you know the Endangered Species Act has been has had its opposition off and on, um, but there is definitely kind of an effort now in the House, the Republican-led House, against it, um, and that we at the Center for Progressive Reform have been kind of participating in testimonies and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about sort of a quick summary of what's happening and the role that um, you in particular or the center generally are are doing right now with the Endangered Species Act um, in the House? Sure, House Republicans primarily um, continue in their efforts to weaken the Endangered Species Act. Um, I think they've put together some sort of task force or committee to come up with amendments to the statute, most of which would um, substantially diminish its effectiveness. Um, my colleagues at the Center for Progressive Reform, as well as I, have um, engaged in a number of, of efforts to try to um, stave off those sorts of weakening amendments and actually encourage Congress to um, increase funding for the statute or, or uh, strengthen um, the law itself. We've um, provided some advice to congressional uh, staff members, um, primarily on the Democratic side. Um, we've uh, done blog posts, uh, op-eds, um, those sorts of things um, to kind of get the word out uh, about the importance of the Endangered Species Act. Um, so we want to serve as a resource um, for members of Congress to um, both talk about the, the ins and outs of the law itself, but also um, the importance um, uh, of the law in protecting biodiversity. Um, our clinic at Lewis and Clark um, also represented um, several members uh, of the House, several Democratic members of the House, in an amicus brief um, that was filed with the district court in the challenge to the massive um, federal oil um, and gas lease in Alaska, the Willow um, lease. And so uh, our clinic represented um, a number of uh, Democrats in the House um, and pointed out that the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service were not adequately um, implementing uh, the law by essentially ignoring um, the impacts of the greenhouse gas emissions produced in that massive federal oil and gas lease and um, essentially ignoring those impacts on threatened and endangered species. Um, so there are some excellent uh, members of the House um, on the Democratic side that are pushing back against efforts um, to weaken this, uh, the Endangered Species Act. Unfortunately, of course, at this, at least at this point, the Republicans control um, the House. And so they're kind of pushing forward um, with an anti-ESA agenda. But, you know, by providing information um, to both members of Congress, to the public, um, and even uh, to um, judges, um, we're hopefully really pushing back against those efforts. Okay. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to stop recording here.